Python 135. Welcome to the Dixie Cryptid channel. I appreciate you clicking on the video. All right, here we go. Hey, did you guys know that I'm doing audio books now? I've got five audio books out on Audible and iTunes. Let me just go through the list real quick here. The first three I did were a series called The Beast of Bray Road by Tom Lyons and Travis Clark. They are three audio books that are about an hour to an hour and a half long. They're inexpensive to buy. I just had a ball doing those. A couple of years ago, I did the first chapter, first and second chapter of the White Mountain Bigfoot. Bobby Clark uh, asked if I would do that, and I was tickled to death to do it because it's a good book. And several people asked that I do the whole audio book. Well, Bobby uh, was good enough to ask me to do his audio book. So we've got both White Mountain Bigfoot volumes that are now available. He's working on number three. And combined, I think it's about six or seven hours of audio book. First one is the Oasis, and the volume two is the Broken Arrow Ranch. The best way to get to those is to go to my website, DixieCrypted.com. Scroll down just past the podcast at the top of the page, and you'll see a whole list of all those books. If you click on the images, you'll go straight to the Audible link, and you can buy those. So if you're interested in more audio about cryptids and really cool, scary, great Western type stories, Beast of Bray Road and the White Mountain Bigfoot series. I'm also working on three more for author Jack LaFountain. He is a great writer. Uh, uh, these are long novels and they're taking a while to do, but I'm working on those. Those are kind of centered around Dogman and they're really good. So I should have those out in the next 60 days, I hope. And I just want to let you guys know that we got audio books out. Go check them out at Audible. Go to my website, DixieCrypted.com. Scroll down to the uh, now available on Audible and iTunes section, and you'll see the book covers. Click on the book covers. It'll take you right to the link. Appreciate you. Here's an email from Chan. Here's what he writes. Most of my fondest memories as a kid growing up in central Mississippi are centered around hunting and fishing. When I was big enough to go hunting and fishing, mostly keeping up with the adults, I got to experience deer camp life. Man, that was an experience all on its own. When I was nine, my dad came home with a frosted ear walker coonhound puppy. He said he'd paid the owner $13 for her, which was the price for registering dog papers in 1981. The guy said he sold her cheap because frosted ear dogs won't hunt. Boy, was he wrong. We named her Lady. Dad and I started training her, and it seemed like no time before we had a year and a half old dog that would hammer out coons in just a few minutes. Around the time I was about 11 or 12, my sister got married. I started spending time with her and her new husband, who, it turns out, loved to hunt as much as me and Dad. So when Dad was at work, I would go hunting with my brother-in-law and his friend. We would hit the cornfields and the river bottoms and hunt sometimes until the early morning hours. Back then, if a landowner saw us hunting, he'd stop and make conversation just so he could hear that frosted ear walker echoing through the night air. Those are the memories that decorate my childhood. One night in the autumn of 1984, Lady and I were heading off on a hunt with my brother-in-law and his friend to some farmland off the Kennebrew Road in Pocahontas, Mississippi. We were riding in an early 70s model two-wheel drive Toyota that my brother-in-law had gotten from his stepdad. It was just an old hunting truck and it had a lot of issues to prove it. When we turned Lady out on the north side of Kinderbrew Road, it wasn't long before she struck and took a small ditch headed south to what we called Kinderbrew Swamp. We jumped in the truck and headed back to the pavement. 
A few minutes later, we were standing on the bridge. The lady had just run under and listening to her run deeper and deeper into the swamp. Suddenly, she started tree barking. My brother-in-law said she's a long way back there, man. That was trouble, and we knew it. The area was posted as private, but we were going to get Dad's dog. We walked along the ditch and head high briars for about 15 minutes until we came to the edge of the swamp. We stopped to catch our breath. Even though it was fall, it was still hot. We stood listening to Lady on the tree for a minute before we started walking towards her. All of a sudden, she stopped. We stopped walking, and my brother-in-law said, Listen. It was so quiet, we could hear an occasional vehicle on Highway 49. We waited about 10 minutes or so, and then we started calling for Lady. Several minutes went by, and we decided we'd better get back to Kinderbrew Road in case Lady went back to where we turned her out. But instead of going back the way we came, we slipped out onto someone's driveway, and we went out that way. As we walked along in the moonlight from deep in the swamp where we'd last heard Lady on the tree, something screamed. It was like a cross between a pig squealing and a bull growling all in one. What was that? I asked, trying not to sound as startled as I was. American Werewolf in London had come out in 1981. I didn't like scary movies and my brother-in-law knew it, but he's a character. So he quipped, oh, oh, that's just the American werewolf from London coming to get you. We all laughed and kept walking. Finally, we got back to the truck, but there was no dog. We drove into a sage field that went all the way to the edge of the swamp. As soon as we stopped and turned off the truck, we heard the sound again coming from the same area. Nobody said a word. It was disturbingly quiet. About 30 seconds went by and it screamed again. Except now, it had cut the distance between us in half. This time, it was my brother-in-law who asked, What was that? His friend said, I don't know any animal that makes that kind of noise and moves that fast. Another 30 or 40 seconds passed and it screamed again. It had to be within 500 yards of us now. We waited another 20 seconds. This time, it was so loud, I felt the rumble in my chest. It couldn't have been more than 75 feet from the field. I think I almost passed out at that point. My brother-in-law's friend crouched down on the floorboard and screamed, Get us out of here! My brother-in-law, who had been standing beside the truck, jumped in and fired it up. He had gone limp, and he said I melted around the gear shift. The truck started and then immediately died. Apparently, When I went limp, I turned off the toggle switch mounted to the gear shift for the add-on 12-volt fuel pump. He had to pull me back up in the seat so he could turn the switch and start the truck again. We didn't stop until we were back on the pavement. We drove around for a while, but we couldn't find Lady. We went home and we told Dad what happened. He and my brother-in-law went back at daylight and called for Lady from the bridge. After just a few minutes, she came out. Dad sure was glad to see her. We told different people about what had happened that night. We got told it was a big cat with its head in a hole. That's why it sounded far away at first. Then it pulled its head out some, and it would sound like it was moving. Some of the older people said that they do this to get game to move. I didn't buy that old tale. It's funny how sounds can trigger memories. Over the past year and a half, I've had three shoulder surgeries. While sitting in my Lazy Boy with tons of time on my hands, I started watching a lot of YouTube channels. My daughter suggested cryptids, and that's how I found your channel. I had binged watched all of your stories when a suggested channel came up with the most terrifying sounds in the Canadian woods. When I heard that scream, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. Every detail of that fall night when I was 12 came flooding back. Until then, I had simply blocked it out. Subconsciously, it must have been what was drawing me to your channel. 
Thank you for not using my real name. There are a lot of people around here who would label me a crackpot. <laughs> you are a crackpot, Chan. I'm just kidding, man. This is a great story. This kind of reminds me of a story I did. I think it was like the second or third video I did about a guy here who told me a story about Bigfoot killing his best dog. And her name was Belle. And uh, he, oh man, this Bigfoot actually got a hold of this dog and impaled it on a uh, sapling that looked like he had broken it off just to shove her down on. Apparently they don't like dogs and they especially don't like coon dogs. And coon dogs, when you know, when they're in the kennel, they're just as friendly as they can be. But you put them on a scent and you turn them loose and they start getting after the coons, man, those things get vicious and they, they will go after scents like that, that Bigfoot leaves behind. And I've heard, I've heard story after story about raccoon dogs doing that. So this was a great story. I appreciate you uh, spending the time. You wrote it well, and we all enjoyed it, Chan. Thank you, sir. This writer wants to be called John Doe. In other words, he doesn't want his real name out there. So John Doe, thanks for this email. I think you guys are going to enjoy this story. He writes, I was born in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, way back in 1970. We lived back in the country, down a road that was beyond the point where the cable company's lines ended. Our vacuum tube TV picked up about three channels back then. One of those channels aired one of my favorite TV shows, it was In Search Of, hosted by Dr. Spock, a.k.a. Leonard Nimoy. By far, the most interesting and scary subject that show covered was Bigfoot. The idea of a creature like that possibly being out in the woods behind our house scared the snot out of me. I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, and I spent a lot of time out in those woods. I built forts and I hiked and was an active participant in all of the BB gun uprisings. We didn't have paintball or airsoft back then, and there were no video games to kill time. We used what we had, and what we had was a solid paradise of woods, complete with old-growth trees and thick undergrowth, woven through with a network of paths and trails that could keep any kid entertained for days. John... If we would have had paintball guns available to us when I was a kid, I was born in 1962. So I'm about, you're about the same age as my brother. I'm eight years older than you. We, we would have terrorized the whole city of Memphis with those paintball guns. So it's probably a pretty good deal. We didn't have those, but I digress. With the nineties came the internet. With the internet came the limitless wealth of information, movies, music, and stories. From time to time, I would use the internet to read and learn about an old favorite subject of mine, Bigfoot. I would look at photos and videos of blurry blobs, check out the evidence found and read about supposed habits. One behavior that was mentioned pretty regularly was tree knocking, whatever. There was never any hard evidence that could make me a believer. In all my years of playing in the woods as a kid and hiking them as an adult, I had never seen anything to convince me that these things were real. In 2017, I was living in Mariana, Florida, in Jackson County. I'd gotten divorced a few years earlier back in Pennsylvania and decided on a change of scenery. So I moved there to be near my elderly mother and help her out, and frankly, to start my life over in another state. During the summer of that year, I had a lot of free time, so I took walks through the town or on the hiking trails down by the river. One day, I decided to take a walk through the historic Mariana Cemetery. At the far end, I saw a big, wide trail that went back into the woods, and I thought to myself, cool. Let's see where this goes. I knew the general area well enough to know that I'd only go about a half a mile before I came to some railroad tracks. About a quarter mile down the path, though, I noticed something odd off to my right. Just a little way back into the woods was a chain-link fence set in a perfect circle. It was about 80 feet in diameter and covered in the typical government no-trespassing-and-keep-out signs, 
that were meant to keep people away, but which only served to stir your curiosity. As I got closer to it, I realized it was surrounding what appeared to be a giant sinkhole. Then I got right up to the fence, and I saw a huge cave opening at the bottom of the hole. I was 47 at the time, but I was still fit. I quickly glanced around to make sure there were no government party poopers ready to stop me from having some fun, and in less than a minute later, I was over the fence and standing at the cave entrance. I didn't have a flashlight with me, but I could see that the cave was very expansive inside. I thought to myself, if I were to ever be homeless, God forbid, I could live in this cave. But for now, with no flashlight and being alone, I would have to put off the exploration for another time. I'm told there are a lot of caves to explore in Jackson County. I jumped back over the fence and got back on the trail. And soon, I was at the railroad bridge that crossed the river. The area was beautiful. Except for the tracks, the miles of lush, thick forest were completely undesecrated by people. I decided to follow the tracks like a large, flat hiking trail. I crossed over the bridge and was off for another brisk walk, just me, the tracks, and nature. I had gone about another mile when about 40 yards into the thicket, I heard it. It was tree knocking. This was not twig snapping. This was a sound akin to a baseball bat hitting a tree trunk. Years of Bigfoot stories rushed through my mind, leaving me both petrified and fascinated as I stood there desperately peering into the vegetation for a glimpse of what could be making that sound. I couldn't see anything. The sequence was one, pause, two, three, knock, pause, knock, knock, I stood there and listened for about three minutes before deciding this sound could only be made by a person hitting a tree, or maybe there was some truth to some of these Bigfoot stories. I would have loved to have had my forty-five semi-automatic pistol, so I could have checked out what was making those sounds. Unfortunately, I have a felony conviction, so purchasing or carrying any kind of Bigfoot deterrent is not an option for me. So I made a wise decision and got the hell out of there. This happened in 2017. Mom and I are back in Pennsylvania now, and I'm working the night shift as a welder. A few months ago, I stumbled across your channel. I've listened to almost every show while I work at night. My personal experience has not made me a believer. However, I can't help but wonder what in the woods smacks a tree with a baseball bat. If there are any investigators who think this area is worth checking out, the location was pretty well described in the story. Have at it. John Doe, this is an interesting story. And what captured me the most is your uh, your spirit for exploration and just going into places that you have never seen before, especially on a beautiful day. Sun's out. The woods are beautiful. And all you have to do is just walk. I love those kind of days. Nobody's expecting anything from you. There's no pressure on you. And you just get to go run into government, fenced off caves, jump the fence and go down and look. And I'm serious. I'm not being sarcastic. I love those kind of days. Uh, I try to have at least 20 or 30 minutes of that kind of moment every day. I usually do that walking my dogs out through the woods behind my house uh, every morning every morning but uh the tree knocking you know who knows what that is my wife's heard some tree knocking close to our place and she swears she swears that nothing that lives in the woods would do that it had to be a human or something with a hand and an elbow and a wrist and a shoulder and a torso that could swing it and hit it against a tree She was out messing with a garden we have in a real low area, about 400 yards away from our house. She was out there by herself and she heard it. And she still talks about it today. She says the creepiest thing I've ever heard. She actually called me on the phone and I went rushing down there with my with my 45 ACP because I didn't know what she was dealing with. So those kind of things happen and they just, they make you wonder forever. So I'm just rambling. I'm sorry. Just kind of sparked some memories in my mind. I thought I'd share it with you. John, thanks for the, thanks for the email. And I hope you're doing well in Pennsylvania, brother.
This Bigfoot story comes from a gentleman who prefers to remain anonymous and who says it's true. I would like to share with you and your audience a sighting I had on the Appalachian Trail a few years back. I'm 50 years old now, but I was 39 when this event unfolded. My friend and I had made plans to walk the Appalachian Trail during summer vacation. We planned to do a different section each vacation until we'd completed it. We decided to start at Springer Mountain in Georgia. We were outfitted with all new packs, sleeping bags, and all the things we needed to complete our hike. We both loved the outdoors, so we were excited about the upcoming two weeks. The first day, we hiked five hours and, not knowing if we would have time to make it to the next one, decided to stop at the sleeping shelter we came to at around three that afternoon. We hung around and took in the beauty of the place. Being outdoors in the Smoky Mountains with my friend was wonderful. We talked with other hikers and sat around and prepared our evening meal. Everyone there was exhausted, so we all turned in for the night. My friend and I slept like rocks that night. The next morning, we were sore from the first day, so we took our time packing up and getting started. As we were going along and enjoying the sights, we passed a couple of ladies who seemed like they were in a hurry. It was as if they were speed walking and not interested in conversation. Later, we stopped so my friend could use the restroom. There was a game trail about five yards downhill from us, so we stepped down to it so she could do her business. It was quite a steep incline to come back up, and I noticed the game trail ran parallel to the main trail. So I suggested we follow it for a while, and maybe we'd find an easier place to get back up to the main trail further down. As we walked down the game trail, I kept hearing voices and laughing. I thought a big group must be coming down the trail. My friend, who was leading, abruptly stopped, and I knew she'd seen something. I asked what it was, but she didn't say a word. She only pointed. I followed her finger to the source and was shaken by what I saw. I pulled her back and we both squatted down as I whispered, Is that real? Did we just see that? She nodded, her eyes wide with shock. I pulled my binoculars from my pack and eased forward, looking around the bush we'd ducked behind. Sitting 30 yards from us and maybe 15 or so yards downhill was a juvenile booger, skunk ape, Bigfoot, whatever you want to call it. It was intent on watching something, so I followed its gaze and found the source of the laughter. A group of about six young people, two young men and four young ladies, had found a waterfall and were having fun cooling themselves off. I leaned back and handed the binoculars off to my friend, who then took her turn. After a minute, she leaned back quickly and flashed a puzzled half-grin. I mouthed the words, what is it? But she just shook her head and handed me the binoculars. I looked down the hill at the swimmers first, then back to where the creature was sitting. I thought, it's just sitting there. Then I realized what she'd seen. It looked like it was masturbating. I leaned back and tried not to laugh. We sat there for a minute more before I suggested we backtrack, but my friend thought we should let the young people know they were being watched. So we went to a spot about 40 yards back down the trail where we could easily climb down to where they were. The place was a sort of a washout that afforded us some cover for quite a way before we risked being exposed to the creature. As we were climbing down, we heard a high-pitched whistle from somewhere above us. The juvenile jumped up and looked around just as my friend's foot dislodged a rock, sending it tumbling down the hill. Run, I said, and she did. I looked over and realized the juvenile was also running. He was heading at an angle that was going to intersect my friend's path. Without a second thought, I took two steps up onto a rock and catapulted myself across the wash, which put me on a trajectory straight for the juvenile. I thought at that moment I was probably a dead man, but I was trying to give my friend a chance. This thing stopped in mid-stride and stared with a mix of disbelief and hatred at the crazy flying human. He was about six feet tall, and from the look on its face, there was no doubt it was going to kill me. 
I'm six foot four and I weigh 225 pounds, but this thing was easily 350 pounds of pure muscle and anger. I never stopped. I doubt I could have. And his expression changed from one of surprise to one of fear. At least that's what I was telling myself as I was barreling at him. From out of nowhere, I felt a sudden sharp blow to my back, and now I was tumbling down the hill trying to get my breath and stop my fall. When I finally came to rest, I saw the creature jump up and down, whooping and pounding the ground. Then I heard a scream and chattering that sounded almost like some kind of language. The juvenile creature looked down, defeated. It dropped to all fours and bolted up the mountain at an unbelievable speed. I watched as it disappeared up the mountain before my eye was drawn to another sight. Not thirty feet behind me was a massive, eight foot tall or better, seven to eight hundred pound female. She looked right at me and I swear I saw empathy in her eyes. She seemed to communicate with me in my head. It was so strange, but I clearly heard her say she was sorry that she hit me with the rock and that her child was chasing after us. She said that he was getting too unruly and would be dealt with. Then she turned and dashed up the hill with more grace and speed than the juvenile. I knew then what had made him afraid. It wasn't me. It was Mama. A minute later, the two young men from the waterfall were asking me if I was okay I said I was, and they helped me down to the pool of water where I sat for what seemed like hours in total disbelief. My friend sat with me answering their questions. The rock she'd dislodged had alerted them, and they'd all looked up the hill in time to see the entire event. Apparently, my friend had screamed when I said run, but I hadn't heard anything but silence. It felt like I was in a time warp with everything slowed down and out of proportion. What seemed like hours had taken place in a matter of seconds. The young people were students at a nearby college who often came to this spot to swim and hang out. They were nice and couldn't believe what they'd seen. They kept talking about how brave I was. The truth is, I was stupid. To them and my friend, though, I was a hero now. We left with them, and they gave us a ride to where our car was parked. That ended our hiking for good. Now if I'm hiking, it's with a large group armed with automatic weapons. Well, that's our story, and we don't care if anyone believes it or not. We know the truth. Thanks very much for allowing us to share, and keep the stories coming. I just ordered The Dude. No, not the movie, The Dude, although that was a great movie. I ordered The Dude Yeti Bar Soap, and I can't wait to see what's up with The Dude. Uh, I was looking at their website today, and they also have a Dixie Cryptid Salve. It's a, it's a Dixie Cryptid, it's a moisturizer. Uh, Yeti Bar Soaps is a great company. That's the only thing I bathe with now, because I just love the scents several different scents that they put out sometimes i use a different scent every day yetibars.net or yetibars on facebook and at checkout use the discount code dc10 and get 10 percent off your purchase go check them out Here's an email from Thomas, and this is a uh, long story. It's going to take a few minutes to get through, but it is so good. It's really good. It's a Honey Island Swamp Monster recollection by this man, and I, I again, I think you're going to enjoy it. My stories are set in the swamps of the Pearl River in South Mississippi, commonly known as the Honey Island Swamp. They happened from 1976 to 1979. The stories actually began many years before. I was born nearby and was literally raised in those woods from Pearl River, Louisiana, through Picayune, Mississippi, to Bogalusa, Louisiana, and northward. The swamp is about one to three miles wide along each side of the river as it meanders through the Louisiana and into the Mississippi. 
My earliest memories of a child growing up were of hunting and fishing with my dad and close family. My dad was also born nearby and raised in those woods, as had several generations before us. We knew the swamp. We knew every fishing hole, every bayou, every oxbow, and every acorn flat for miles in every direction. We would often go hunting before daylight without the use of lights if the moon was out. That's how well we knew it. We lived on the bank of a high bluff overlooking the Pearl River. The first encounter began in early spring of 1976. I had just come home from the service after being gone for four years. My best friend had heard of my arrival and contacted me to ask if I'd like to go fishing and camping for a few nights at our favorite fishing spot. Of course, I was more than eager to go, so we met up at my house and got our gear together, what little gear that we had. I borrowed my dad's boat and off we went. Man, it felt so good to be home, to be cruising up the river with the wind in my face and the different smells of the woods passing through my nostrils, some of which it had been many years since I had experienced. I was home. My friend, I'll just call him Tom, was a lifelong friend. We had chased girls together, hunted and fished together, and done all the normal young kid stuff, and we had become very close. I would very easily say he was one of my best friends that I ever had. It took about 40 minutes to arrive at where we turned into the Black Creek out of the main river. Black Creek is a natural bayou that forms in the hills and finds its way through into the main river after a couple of miles. It is lined with natural pristine oaks and cypress with huge moss-covered limbs that hang like arms reaching into the water. So abundant are these trees that even in the middle of the day the creek possesses an eerie darkness. Of course, to me, it is all beautiful. I love this area. We cruised upstream into the bayou slowly because of snags, and we arrived at our old camping spot right on the bank of the creek. This time of year, the river is in a high water stage, and all the backwoods are flooded, leaving small islands scattered throughout the backwater. These islands range from about a half an acre to five or six acres until you got close to the hills, which abruptly went up to dry land. But the catfishing was excellent in these backwater bottoms during high water, accessible only by boat. We started setting up camp, which consisted of gathering firewood, unloading sleeping bags, and taking out a cast iron skillet with cornmeal and cooking oil. That was about it. No tent, no tarp, no anything else. Camping in nature at its best. Quickly, we set out our trot lines and we baited them. Then we returned to the camp and waited for dark to come so we could run our lines and catch my first mess of fish in quite a while. Our light for fishing was a car headlight wrapped with cardboard to keep from burning our hands, with two long wires which were twisted around a car battery post and connected to the back of the light. As darkness approached, we set out to run our lines. Man, we were tearing them up. As soon as we got back to camp, I grabbed four or five three-pounders and went to cleaning, filleting, and cooking. I probably have never tasted fried catfish as good as those were, even though I had eaten them many times in the past. We had also brought some potatoes and onions, which we smothered in a separate skillet. Y'all, I'm telling you, sitting on the creek bank eating fresh fried catfish and smothered potatoes and onions is simply divine. By now, it was about 9 o'clock. We were full and the fire was warm and we laid beside it. It had died down to hot coals with a warm glow and slumber was growing strong in our bodies as our conversation about the years when I was gone began to grow silent. It was bliss. Earlier while cooking, I had culled a few bad potatoes by throwing them out into the woods to keep ants down around the camp. I was almost asleep when I heard something stirring in the woods. It found one of those potatoes and promptly ate it. The sound of the crunching potato was somewhat loud. The animal was eating it whole. Neither that thought nor the loud noise bothered me much, 
I just thought it was a cow that had broken out of the field, wandered down into the woods, and had gotten trapped on the island due to high water. I heard it walk over to the location of the other potato. It put the whole thing in its mouth and crunched once again. By this time, I was paying more attention to this animal as it was walking about in the woods to locate the other potato. I looked over at my friend as he asked me if I could hear that, to which I said yes. We continued to look at each other as it found the third potato and crunched it all at once, just like before. The fire had died down, so light around our camp was almost non-existent. We had not brought alternate lighting except the car light hooked up to the battery, which was often sitting in our boat. It was about 40 feet away. In the almost perfect silence of the night, this animal had begun to walk a little closer to our camp. And Tom asked, do you hear what I hear? As reluctantly as he asked the question, I reluctantly answered with a question. Is that thing walking on two feet? To which he replied, I think it is. As we spoke those few words, we sat up. It must have startled the animal. With a growling kind of roar that is hard to describe, it charged out of the woods towards us. I yelled, run to the boat, even as we were both already doing so. And then I yelled for Tom to twist the wire on the post to get the light on. I had ordered a 30-30 rifle from Sears that had arrived by mail that morning. I had brought it just to plink around with it to try it out. I immediately chambered around and prepared to shoot at this charging animal. How Tom got the wires on the battery so quickly, he literally dove into the boat head first, I will never know. As soon as the light was shined on the animal, which was only a few yards away, it stopped still dead in its tracks. It was about to come out of the thick brush it had run through to get us. It stood there breathing heavily not like it was out of breath, but from the sheer volume of its lungs. I think this thing was at least partially, if not completely, nocturnal. It had eyes that were highly sensitive to bright light, that being the only thing that stopped its charge. I didn't fire my weapon, even though I was scared to death. I could barely make out some huge form in the bushes. Not able to see it in its entirety and knowing that I needed to see what I was shooting at, I couldn't pull the trigger. I was taught from my youth not to shoot until you know your target. That lesson was reinforced during my time in the service. Whatever this was, it retreated slowly back into the woods, growling as it went. After a few minutes, nothing else happened, so we slowly went back by the fire and we stoked it up. We sat around the fire, which was really going good by now, and waited. I had my gun at the ready. And there were no other events that night. Needless to say, we didn't sleep for the rest of the night, but we did have a big fire. The next morning, we broke camp, and we went home and told almost no one what had happened. My dad, from whom I had borrowed the boat and who knew of my desire to stay a few days, inquired as to why we had come home so early. So I related the story to him in the presence of an uncle and a cousin. It was as big of a mistake as I thought it would be. They did not believe us, and we were accused of having overactive imaginations, and they made us the brunt of a good chuckle, even though my dad knew neither I nor Tom were prone to such things. So we just kept it to ourselves, and we forgot about it. I have told this story to a few people outside of the family, but not to very many because the response is always the same. One must understand that in mind or memory, neither I or Tom had anything to compare this experience with. Nothing I had experienced before was anything like it. Even though I had been in these woods all my life, as a child, as a youth, and as a young man, night and day, winter and summer, I had seen and heard every noise an animal could make. But nothing compared to this experience. Honestly, after a while, I even doubted myself until the second time. I've heard many people say they smell awful odors associated with their encounters, but I had not had that experience. Perhaps wind direction played a role? I really don't know. I have smelled very strong odors and heard panthers scream all my life in the woods. 
but I have attributed smells to dead animals, and these sounds to something natural. Actually, I never really thought anything about these smells or noises for a long time. I have not actually physically seen in full view a Bigfoot, but after these experiences, I will be okay with that. My second experience in the Honey Island Swamp happened in the winter of 1976. My dad was an avid squirrel hunter, and that's mainly what we did until I got back from the service and began to deer hunt. I had always wanted to do it as a young kid. The woods were full of feral hogs and deer, a hunting paradise with numerous oxbows and deep bayous full of crappie, bass, shellcracker, bluegill, and other fish. We had come to our houseboat to spend a few days squirrel hunting. We'd arrive later in the day, and our anticipation for the morning hunt was high. The houseboat was warm, comfortable, and we were getting hungry. So we looked about our pantry to see what there was to eat. We always left more canned goods than we ate and often would just make what we called goulash out of whatever was available. Goulash was always tasty and had a little bit of everything in it. A few beans, some corn, a can of chili, a little rice, or whatever else would fit in the pot. It was definitely good, but everyone knew you didn't eat too much or you would pay the price, gastronomically speaking. As we began to concoct this tasty delight, I thought how good it would truly be if we had some fried rabbit to simmer in brown gravy and add this to the magnificent recipe. So I suggested that we go up near Black Creek on an island that was always full of rabbits, coons, possums, and various game because of the high water and shoot one rabbit to go in our stew. All seconded this idea, so we got in the boat and we struck out. On this trip was me and my dad, along with my uncle and cousin that I had mentioned earlier. They were the same ones who ridiculed and laughed at me, especially my cousin, Big Dan. We called him this because he looked like a linebacker on a professional football team. He was a big, solid guy, but easygoing and as good a soul as any, even though he had all but rubbed me raw about my Bigfoot encounter. By the way, I thought the shows and concept of Bigfoot made for good scary movies and were a good way to have a scary night. But all in all, I didn't believe it was real. At least I didn't yet. We landed the boat on the bank of an island in Black Creek and Big Dan and I got out, each with a shotgun. Dad and my uncle stayed in the boat because we would only take a minute to procure a rabbit and be back to the boat promptly. I was the only one with the light, so Dan stayed right behind me as we started our short sweep of the island. After we had gone about a 100 yards from the boat, I was quite surprised that we had seen nothing. We broke out of a thick brush into a small clearing, which was the makeup of all the island. No rabbits, no coons, no possums. There were no hogs, birds of any kind at all. I found that extremely unusual given the high water and usual dense population of wildlife on this island. As we pushed through some of the more thick brush and into another small clearing, there was just nothing. It was eerily devoid of any game and unusually quiet. We proceeded on with Big Dan right behind me. The night was pitch black dark. We could see a thousand stars in this country sky. As we began to walk through some more brush, Big Dan tapped me on the shoulder and asked, What was that? What was that? He said he had heard something in the water behind us. I stopped to listen, thinking that it was a deer or a hog swimming to the island, but I didn't hear anything. As I listened, Dan said, Did you hear it that time? And I heard what sounded like a log truck taking off in low gear and staying in that gear too long before letting off the gas. I explained to Dan that it was possible to hear trucks from quite a long distance because the high water would carry noises for a long way, often miles. I started to walk again, not even thinking of the encounter from last year that had taken place just on the other side of the creek we came up, less than 300 yards from where we stood now. The brush was getting thicker as we walked. Dan tapped me on the shoulder again and asked if I heard that. 
By now, I was starting to get a little aggravated, thinking that if he wasn't quiet, we were never going to kill a rabbit. And then I heard a distinct, familiar growl. I'd heard this growl before, and this time it was much closer. I told Dan that this was the same animal that had rushed me and Tom previously and that we needed to get out of there. At that moment, it let out another, louder, growling roar, and I anxiously told Dan, let's go now. We started walking faster through the thick brush. We hadn't gone but a few yards when this thing charged with another growling roar, and we could easily hear it tearing through the brush towards us. And I shouted to Dan, run! Now I was the only one with the light, and I was not slow. And as we ran, I could hear over the noise I was making through the brush and the animal gaining to the point that I knew it was grabbing Dan, who was tightly on my heels. As I turned to shoot, Dan was in perfect sync with me, both of us with our guns raised to fire. And in that moment, all of it happened in a split second, I realized we were both aiming at an angle that would have us firing at about eight feet high. That is where the growling huff was coming from. The animal stopped just short of full view. I could barely make out a form through the brush with my light. I didn't see eyes and I could only make out its form, but it was huge. I believe it was shielding its eyes from the light. I think bright lights hurt a nocturnal animal's eyes more so than humans, because it is said that nocturnal animals' eyes gather much more light than ours. I told Dan to start backing up. We backed up as the animal continued to growl. Once we got some distance between us and it, I shouted to Dan, RUN! And run we did, again. Just as before, I was not slow about it, but Dan kept up until we ran all the way back to the boat where my dad and uncle were waiting. And when we got there, I ran all the way to the back of the boat, and I grabbed the Q-beam light and flicked it on with my gun raised. Dan was scurrying at the bow, getting it untied as I was barking orders for my uncle to sit down and my dad to start the motor and get us out of there. All of this was amidst the protest and confusion of my dad and uncle, both of whom were wondering what in the world was going on. Soon I realized this animal was now not on our heels, and I was able to answer my dad that whatever it was that had gotten after me last year was still here. I cannot repeat the few choice words he spoke after that. Suffice it to say that he was not impressed with my excited response and still adamant request to leave now. Immediately, my dad, who still didn't realize I was ready to get out of there now, began to ask me why I had waited through the water at the end of the island shortly after we left. I didn't, I told him, but he was adamant that I had. He said he heard me walking in the water, and I reiterated that I had not walked in the water. And to prove it, I shined the lights on my boots. They were bone dry. This caught him off guard for a moment because he knew he heard walking on the edge of the water. He finally cranked the motor and we started out of Black Creek. There was silence in the boat as we journeyed back to the houseboat. When we got there, Dan, who had a few minutes to reflect on the events, told me that he was wrong and now he believed me. This was a moment of sweet acquittal within a moment of chaos. We settled back down in the comfort and safety of our houseboat. Not much was said or discussed about the event, nor was it ever. We had been in those woods for all our lives, and except for me, had never experienced anything like this prior to now. We had no point of reference to reconcile this moment. Three months later, Dan, who had lived next to me on the edge of the swamp, moved his family about 40 miles away to what he called civilization. He lives there still today. As far as I know, he never went back. The whole event was worth it to me because now the one who had ridiculed me the most now believed. And my dad, though still very skeptical, I think at least doubted his skepticism of my story which was good enough for me. Little did he know that not far off in the distant future, he would come a lot closer to believing. 
My father had been a gunner on a transport ship in World War II. He shot down several kamikaze planes trying to hit his ship. One finally got through, exploding on the deck in front of his gun turret. He ducked and grabbed his legs in a ball and he held his breath. I'm sure he thought that moment would be his last. For many, sadly, it was. I tell you this for one reason. My dad was a strong man mentally and not prone to foolishness. But he was a good man. To me, he was the best dad in the world. He raised me to be honest and respect others and to work hard. Just as importantly, he spent time with me hunting, fishing, and in life in general. I had just come home from the military service when I had my first encounter. To say the least, it tempered the foolishness one might have after having one of those experiences, as it had with my father before me. His encounter took place in the Honey Island Swamp in the winter of 1978. It was our tradition on the men's side to spend the week of Thanksgiving camping and hunting on the river. Vacations were taken, schoolwork was forgiven, and jobs set aside in advance. It was a tradition. This particular year, the group consisted of my dad, me, two nephews who were old enough to use outboard boats on their own, and a couple of their friends. We would leave out Friday afternoon and camp until Wednesday night and go home and have Thanksgiving and then return to the camp Thursday afternoon. Then we'd stay until Saturday and be home for church on Sunday. After a few days of successful hunting, we all got ready to leave Wednesday afternoon. My dad decided to stay by himself because none of us planned to be at the house for Thanksgiving. He and Mom would host Christmas instead. The distance from our camp on the river to our house was about a 45-minute run upstream. So we all left out Wednesday afternoon, boats trailing off in the distance, leaving the camp area seemingly deserted. Dad decided he would not hunt that afternoon. Instead, he decided to take an afternoon off and relax. After all, he was the only one there. Our camp was on a long peninsula where the river almost came back on itself, sort of like the shape of Florida. In this long finger of an almost island, it was very thick with briars, vines, small trees, and thick brush. So much so, it was impenetrable to man. One could see game trails leading into and out of the thick brush and vines. As night began to fall, Dad had pumped up the Coleman lantern, built a small fire, and cooked something to eat. He had made a pot of coffee and was retiring to a night of extreme peace, or so he thought. At about 10 that night, he decided to retire in the tent for a perfect night's rest. He placed his shotgun inside his tent because the fog was thick that night. He had lain there for about 30 minutes when he heard a loud crash down the thicket quite a way. Nothing about the noise was alarming. He thought it was a hog or deer getting out of the thicket and into the swamp to feed. My father was getting drowsy when he heard something approaching the camp. He listened as a pot clanged as if something had eaten the contents and then thrown it aside. He heard it again as if something was eating the leftovers from the evening supper and discarding the pots. The Coleman lantern was out and the campfire had all but gone out. The only light was a faint glow from about a quarter moon. Now the animal had my dad's attention, at least somewhat. As he lay there quietly listening, the animal walked around and then towards the tent. This was a circular tent about eight feet by eight feet. The tent had six foot of headroom in the center. It was actually my tent. I had purchased it because I am six feet tall and I wanted a tent that I could stand up in when I needed to. The animal approached the tent and it brushed against the tent wall. Dad related the next moment of the story and I could see chills run down his face. He said that a hand lightly rubbed across the top of the tent as if it was feeling the material. And so I asked him, what did you do, Dad? He said he took the shotgun and he struck the animal, presumably against its leg with the butt of the shotgun. 
The animal jumped back and startled and growling, probably presuming no one had been in there when it came into the camp. And then it slowly began to retreat into the woods with barely a noise. Dad reluctantly admitted that after a while that it sounded as though it was walking on two feet. The spot where we were camped was very remote. The only way to or from there was by a boat, especially at that time of year. It was high water season, and between us and civilization were flooded creeks, backwater, and swamps for miles. The next day, I was the first to arrive back at camp, bringing my dad a very full plate of Thanksgiving ham, turkey, dressing, and all the related goodies. I knew he would be hungry for them, but as I landed the boat, I could tell something was wrong. His demeanor was noticeably down as if something was weighing heavily on his mind. I inquired as to what was wrong, but he denied anything was wrong. I knew my dad and I knew something was off, so I kept asking. After not really much more persistence, he related the whole story. And to the best of my knowledge, I was the only person he ever told, and I respected his silence. To this day, I've never told this story to anyone outside of very close family members, and only one or two of those who asked me. He never camped again in that spot, and I never camped again at that place where I had my encounter. We camped in areas not far from them, but it was just too much to camp at the exact locations again. Well, those are some of my stories while living the dream as a young man. I know some folks may believe and some won't, but I know they are true because I lived them. And that's good enough for me. Thomas, I think this is probably one of the best put together stories I've read since I've been doing this channel. You know, it's not too much detail and it's not too vague. It's just perfect. And they're great memories. I mean, when you were writing about how you love the area You know, men who grow up and were raised in these lowland areas and they kind of know and understand the swamps and the, you know, the tree covered channels and the big swole up cypress trunks and the cypress knees everywhere. Those places are home to us. I mean, I love it. I remember someone asking me, man, wouldn't you love to live up in the Rocky Mountains or in the even the Appalachian or the Smoky Mountains? And I'm like, no. I love these lowland areas. I love these swampy areas. I love the places that are just hotter than hell in the summertime. The muddy rivers and the oxbows and the creeks and the swamps. It just feels like home to me. More than anything else, that's how this story has affected me. But apparently there is something going on in the Honey Island Swamp. There are so many stories from that area. And that area is so remote. It is habitat that is full of game and so remote that some unknown creature could absolutely live in there and sustain itself and breed and reproduce and do all the things that a species needs to just keep living because these stories keep coming out of that area. Honey Island Swamp in South Mississippi and North Louisiana. All right, thank you guys for uh, hanging with me in this video. I have really enjoyed putting it together. And we will see you guys on the next video. Thanks.